morning to you all. Uh, for this today's uh, first session, we have with us uh, Professor Jatindra Kumar Naik. He is a retired professor of English from Utkal University and he is a renowned translator. Professor Naik has uh, translated uh, several works of Odia into English it, and including Yantra Gudha. It's a novel by Chandrasekhar Rath. Its title in English is Astride the Wheel, for which he has uh, received the 2004 Hutch Crossword Book for India, Indian Language Fiction Translation. He also has won Kata Translation Award for the English rendering of uh, Tarun Kanti Mishra's short story as the descent. <clears throat> Professor Nayak is a co-translation and translator of the English translation of Odia novel Cha Mana Atha Kuntha by Mohan Senapati. Okay. <clears throat> Mohan Senapati. This English translation was first published in the USA under the title Six Acres and a Third. He also has translated into English the Atma Jibana Charitra, the autobiography of Fakir Mohan Senapati as story of my life. His other notable translations in English include uh, the translation of uh, Jagannath Prasad's Desha Kala Patra as a time elsewhere. He has founded an organization, Rupantar, where uh, in Bhuvaneshwar, where he publishes uh, Odia books in English. Sir, we welcome you on behalf of NTM and uh, I request you to uh, begin your session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, at the outset, I must express my gratitude to uh, National Translation Mission and the um, Center of Excellence for Translation and Life Writing, Ramadevi University, uh, for giving me this great opportunity. I feel honored to be invited to speak on a subject which I find fascinating. I think I congratulate you on choosing this particular topic because it's very timely. Uh, I say this because I think discussions on translation need to be reoriented, uh, should be given a new direction because for a very long time uh, we have been talking about translation in ways, looking at translation through lenses which actually distort our experience of translating uh, texts in one language into other, another. So I thought I would talk about my own personal experience as a translator and use that as the basis of making a few generalizations, making a few observations which might be useful to uh, people who aspire to translate, who would like to engage in translation activities because this is extremely important. Um, as you know, I think uh, National Translation Mission is doing this wonderful job of translating knowledge texts into various languages of India, Indian languages. And in a multilingual, multicultural nation like India, the role of translation cannot be overemphasized. So translation is actually a matter of survival for India. And we have been doing it, uh, we have been talking about it, we have been discussing it in ways which I find um, extremely misleading and in very, are doing it in very unproductive ways. So I am not a scholar, uh, I am not a translation scholar, I am a translator. So I will be talking about the experience of translating and before I do so I will talk about what is wrong with the way we talk about translation. And most of what I would say will be based on anecdotes rather than on uh, material that we will find in libraries because translators are not supposed to be scholars. They translate texts and so don't expect a very scholarly uh, presentation from me. In fact, uh, many people think that I am not a scholar but at the moment they know that I am a translator, they say he translates. So I sometimes protest and say, well I read. I read the books I translate. So this is the kind of misconception 
that clouds our understanding of translation. So, the first thing that we must bear in mind when we talk about translation is that most of us have been programmed, have been trained to look at translation as a mechanical activity. The moment that this is, for this, I think translation studies, the way it's taught in different universities and colleges is responsible. We look upon translation as a primarily as a mechanical activity. The moment one talks about translation, immediately here, target language, source language, fidelity, equivalence, as if it's a mechanical activity, it's done by a machine. So this is the first thing that strikes one when one talks about translation, that we look upon it as a mechanical activity, an activity involving a kind of mechanical transfer of meaning from one language into another. As if we are coolies, there is meaning in one language, it is available in a material form, we carry it like a coolie into another language, another linguistic world. So this is the first misconception that translation studies has promoted uh, historically. Sometimes in order to overcome this problem, we talk about translation of culture, that translation is not translation of one language or one language text into another, one linguistic text, text in one language into another, but it's actually translation of culture. But even then, we are actually talking about in a very mechanistic way. We still think of meaning existing in one culture, one language, and it has to be transferred through the application of certain techniques into another culture, another language. So this whole model is seriously deficient. It is actually misleading. Uh, so why this happens, I will come to it later. But let me talk about it for a little longer because for young people, they must get rid of this notion of translation as a mechanical activity. That's something that can be learned uh, in a school or in a college because long ago, I think translation was taught in government schools when we were children. Um, there will be 10 sentences in the exam and you translate them and you get good marks. Each sentence carries one mark, so if you uh, mistranslate, that again is a very dangerous notion because the conception, the assumption is that every sentence has only one equivalent. So 10 sentences translated into English gives you, to give you 10 marks. So this is again this promoted, this posted, this mechanistic or mechanical notion of translation as a very, uh, what should I say, uh, mechanical activity that, that, that can be predicted. Uh, there is only one equivalent of a sentence. There can be three uh, equivalents or three possibilities of translating it. So already we were programmed to see translation as a highly mechanical activity. So our education system, our translation studies department, the way we talked about translation, fostered this notion that translation doesn't involve creativity, translation doesn't involve the imagination, and translation doesn't involve a plurality of interpretations. So, translation was condemned from the very beginning to be seen as derivative, as mechanical, as unoriginal. So, this weighed heavily against translation as an activity which could lead to a kind of creativity. And this also reveals an ignorance about the historical role that translation has played in the course of human development of human civilization. I'll come to that later. So, to recapitulate uh, what I already said, or some of what I already said, is that to begin with the misleading assumption that translation doesn't involve creativity or imagination. Because, partly because I think translation was seen or regarded initially as a branch of applied linguistics. For a very long time we only dealt with sentences. We never bothered about larger chunks of text or the entirety of a text. We only bothered about the sentence. So grammar doesn't go beyond sentences or linguistics, particularly linguistic theory of translation always worried about 
sentences and talked about equivalence, talked about, about translation shift, vocabulary. So we never thought of translation as a creative activity. Then the cultural term that translation took also didn't help much. We still operated within the framework of linguistic theories of translation and then we just expanded the field to inculcate, to include, uh, for instance, groceries or certain sensitivity to um, cultural nuances, uh, culture specific terms and then we talked about domestication, organization, as if the translator is working in a vacuum. So I will come to uh, that point uh, a little later, but now to sum up, I will emphasize that translation involves a terminology of is encompassed by a terminology of negativity. Whenever we talk about translation, we use negative phrases or negative terms, like trans there is a loss in translation. The moment we talk about translation, immediately whenever I take a class, immediately somebody would stand up like a soul thumb and ask, uh, so there is poetry that is lost in translation. The essence is not uh, captured by a translation. I said, are you a perfume seller? Do texts have a perfume which cannot be captured in uh, a translation? So the other thing is that the translation is not faithful to the original. That the original is somehow uh, distorted or somehow distorted through translation. And the translator um, is a traitor. In fact, in, uh, in Italian, there is this expression that the translator is a traitor. He is in, engages in an act of treachery to the original. So the, there is this long tradition of, of seeing translations as less than the original. That the original is monumental and the translation is either an act of treachery to the original, there is something that is irretrievably lost when you translate something. So on the whole, you can see that translation is surrounded by a terminology of negativity. It's doomed to derivativeness. You are not doing anything creative, you are not doing anything imaginative. You are engaged in an uncreative, unimaginative act of merely transferring something supposed to be the meaning of the original, the essence of the original into another language. And therefore, uh, in the academic world, people say, don't read a translation, read the original, as if it's possible. As if you could know 300 languages and read everything in the original. As if a student of English literature can learn classical Greek and read Aristotle in the original. And so we always depend on translations. We cannot do it without translations. 60% of whatever we read is actually translation. But we are always suspicious of translations. We are always skeptical of translations. So this is this, there is this debilitating paradox that we depend on translations. We cannot do without translations. Whatever we read, actually 80% of it is translation. For instance, how many of us know Russian? But we have read the stories. We have read Paul's. How many of us know French? Every student you go uh, and meet in a department of English, talk about Derrida, Bath, Foucault, how many of them know French? But in the same breath, at the same time, everybody is suspicious of teaching a translated text, reading a translated text, because they think that it's somehow essentially deficient. So the terminology of negativity surrounds a translated text and we look at it through a lens of suspicion, mistrust and misgivings. So this is the other thing that our approach, very approach to a translated text is negative. So this is also a cultural problem that maybe you can go back to the age of romanticism when originality was valorized, originality was uh, prized by everyone and they thought that anything that is a translation is not uh, to be taken very seriously. But in the 18th century, Pope was actually treated very 
uh, with great respect because he translated Homer into English or Dryden's translation of uh, Virgil's Iliad. So, historically, I think there are times when translation was regarded with great respect, translators were treated with great uh, respect, and then there are periods when translators are regarded with either open hostility or lurking suspicion. So this is the other point I try to make that we, generally speaking, tend to look upon translation with suspicion, distrust, and misgivings. And I also pointed out that without translation, our world can't survive. Whatever we read, if you take, if you uh, calculate or you count the number of books we read in translation or have to read in translation, you notice that 60-70% of our, our knowledge is derived from texts that have been translated into our mother tongues or into English. So, this is the paradoxical situation that whenever we talk about translation from a translator's perspective, we notice that everybody reads translation, nobody regards translation very highly. So this paradox has to be dealt with, recognized and then dealt with. So, I remember a limerick which uh, uh, J.P. Das once wrote that the translator is a God-faced monkey, not a monkey-faced God. So that's how we, and we know that translate, historically translators have faced uh, great tragedies. Uh, whoever translated the Bible, many of them were burnt under stake. Uh, Pindal and many of us were actually born at the stake because they translated the Bible into uh, English or uh, European vernaculars like French or German or Italian. So translators have always been uh, a vulnerable community. They are sometimes physically endangered because powers that we consider them uh, to be uh, destroying the monopoly of knowledge ex exercised over texts by the priesthood or by uh, powerful people. And recently, uh, the Japanese translator of Satanic verses were stabbed to death by a fanatic. So translation has always been regarded with suspicion and hostility and academically in the translation studies framework treated uh, with suspicion, misgiving and generally speaking uh, looked upon as a secondary, second order activity that it's not creative, it's not imaginative. And nobody here pauses to ask this very simple question. Criticism is also a second order activity. No critic can write a poem. No critic of Dickens can write a novel like Oliver Twist. No critic of the Westland can write a poem like P.S. Eliot. But critics are not considered to be uh, useless or unimaginative. Now criticism uh, claims increasingly in the postmodern uh, why critics claim, demand to be treated as creative writers, that criticism is also a creative activity. But the same kind of status is not granted to translators. They are also doing something that is second order. They are not creating something, they are basing whatever they do on something or a text that already exists. So in a way they are also doing what critics do, but we are quite respectable towards critics and quite dismissive towards translation. So, translators have to cope with, deal with this kind of hostility, indifference and suspicion. So, this is another very important factor that although it's a second order activity, it, it has to uh, deal with texts that are already been produced. No translator can create a text that he goes to translate. Obviously, but no critic also creates a text that he is going to criticize or evaluate. So, criticism and translation share the same status of being derivative activities, but great critics are possible. So, similarly, we can think of great translations and translators to be possible, but we somehow don't grant translation that kind of status. So, this is something, this is food for thought, particularly for young people who will take up uh, translating seriously in future, should think about this, that this is what the prevailing climate has done to the status of the translator. That the translator is always seen 
as someone who is incapable of being creative, who cannot be accused of being imaginative, who does something that is derivative, treacherous, and therefore he has to be tolerated, but rendered invisible. So, we don't bother about translators. We don't bother about translations, although we, for our survival, for our academic survival, for our cultural survival, we need to depend on translations. We cannot do without translations, but we are unwilling to grant translation the status it eminently deserves. Now let me come to the more important point of the historical importance of translation. Well, historically, civilization could have done without translation. We can't conceive of human civilization, human culture without translation. So, I think examples can be multiplied indefinitely. We can give, go on giving examples after examples, but I won't waste your time. I will just focus upon, I will draw your attention to some key examples in history. Think of the uh, Roman civilization. The Romans were great bridge builders, road builders, great military strategists, great legal thinkers, but they didn't have a great literature, they were not great philosophers. So the Romans had to translate the riches, the classics of Greek literature and philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, all these great Greek philosophers and their plays, these had to be translated into Latin in order for Roman civilization to be enriched. And they used Greek slaves because they had militarily defeated Greece. So they had brought over a lot of very knowledgeable, very learned Greeks as slaves. And these slaves were used as pedagogues. You know, pedagogues are actually slaves who accompany children. So these Greek, learned Greek slaves translated the Greek classics in philosophy, in literature and these were these enriched Roman civilization without that you wouldn't have had the Bhagavad you wouldn't have had Horace you wouldn't have the great uh, Roman playwrights so Roman civilization was possible because of translation think of again the Middle Ages when the uh, feudal world uh, struck deep roots in Europe illiteracy prevailed in Europe and lots of Greek texts were lost and they were preserved by the Arabs by translating them into Arabic and these were recovered during the Renaissance. So without translation all these texts should have been lost and humanity would have made the advances it actually did. So translation played this historic role and the whole of Renaissance is actually an age of translation. Because Greek and Roman classics were translated into Italian, into particularly English, so Seneca was translated into English, therefore you had the tragedies of Shakespeare, otherwise uh, tragedies of Shakespeare wouldn't have been possible. They say, Montaigne wrote essays in French and they were translated into English and then the essay of a little form was possible. The Italians were writing sonnets in Italian and these were translated into English and the whole tradition of writing sonnets began to uh, strike roots. And these were again translated into Odia, into Bangla. And in Odisha you have Chakudvasa Padi uh, poems, uh, poems having 14 lines. So this is how translators made it possible for literary forms to travel long distances. And even way back, think of Isaac's figures, where many of them are actually Panchatantra translated into uh, various languages of the world. So you can imagine why civilization without translators translating texts in one language into texts into in other languages. So I can give many more such examples. Think of even Upanishads being translated by at the instance of Dara Sito, or Ramayana and Mahabharata being translated in Persian, Arabian Nights from uh, Persian Arabic translated into other languages of the world and enriching Sakuntara translated by William Jones and then enriching while with Gete read uh, Sakuntara in translation and was thrilled for that it opens up lots of creative possibilities which Europe was absolute stranger to. And modernism, European modernism or modernism in Britain didn't simply have been possible 
without Ezra Pound's translation of Chinese poetry, Japanese no theater, Kabuki theater, and many such things. So, translation yeah, is everywhere in the world to enrich not just literary text but knowledge text. And I forgot to mention how Bible translation transformed the European world and made possible reformation. Without the Bible getting translated into English, into German, into French, we would have had the modern world. Protestantism would simply not have been possible without translation. So, you know, the King James version of the Bible was translated by some 60 scholars or 65 scholars and completely radically reshaped English language. Not Shakespeare, but it's the King James version of the Bible that transformed the English language, authorized version of the Bible. So translation shapes a language, shapes a culture, spreads literacy. And all these things, that's why I think UNESCO has published a, a very uh, interesting book with a resonant title, Translators, Translation Through the Ages, or Translation has played this important role in radically reshaping civilization, introducing new knowledge, new literary text, new literary forms, so that what is created is something like a community of literature, world culture, world civilization could advance because translators made possible or made it possible for knowledge and for literature to travel from one part of the world into another. And within the same culture, translation like the translation of the Bible could perform so many historic roles like the birth of Protestantism, spread of literacy, the birth of modernity, spread of print culture, all these were and the emergence of English as a modern language. The English that people spoke or wrote in the Middle Ages is absolutely incomprehensible and the King James version of the Bible modernized English, made it accessible to ordinary people and shaped, reshaped English language. So, this is the historic role that translation has. So, we cannot discuss translation only in terms of target language, source language, equivalence, translation shift. So, this is a very narrow, constricting way of dealing with translation. So, I will now come to another very important point. As a translator, what I uh, learned from the process of translation, um, because I think uh, this is very important. One very important thing has been systematically undervalued and neglected. That is, what is the experience of the translators? Whenever we talk about uh, translation, we always talk about target language and source language and equivalence. But translation is primarily a human activity. A human being is translating. The machine is not translated. We are talking about machine translation and all that, but this is a fantasy. Translation, writing, creation of new meaning is something that human beings do. Like writing, like painting, like music, translation is a, an essentially or quintessentially a human activity. Human beings do it. A human being does it. So, it involves human experience. It involves interpretation. A translation doesn't do it. A, a translator doesn't do translation because he's interested in equivalence. He's interested in target language and source language and translation shapes and all the jargons. Look up translators and their experiences and try to find out how a translation, translator translates something. That's why people who are translation theorists never translate. Very few translation theorists have translated anything. And people who translate do not engage in translation theory. Because translators, when we have never examined the motives of translators, because we do not see, we do not look upon translation as a human activity. I'll just cite a few examples. For instance, take Fakir Mohan Samatati, a very famous Odia writer, or the founder of modern Odia literature, who translated the Ramayana and the Mahabharata into Odia. 
did he do it because he was a student of Utkal University struggling with uh, target language, source language and equivalence and uh, linguistic theory of translation and all that? He undertook the translation of the Ramayana because he had lost the son, the disease. His son died, young child, they died. And his wife was disconsolate. So in order to console her, he translated the Ramayana different uh, cantos of the Ramayana and read it aloud to her so that his wife would be solaced with the translation. The translation will solace her, give her, bring her solace, bring her consolation. And his wife told him, well, I have lost a son, but this translation is my son. So translation can console, translation can solace somebody. I'll give you another example. During the Bhakti movement, all over India, people started translating. They are not students of translation studies. Mahabharata and the Ramayana, they were translated all over India into different Indian languages. And Odisha, Saralama Das translated the Sarala Mahabharata. And look at this very interesting phenomenon. European translation theorists are always worried about the translator's invisibility. In fact, Lawrence Venuti has written a fascinating book on the translator's invisibility that the translators are rendered invisible in translation theories, that we don't bother about the translator when we read a translated text. We only worry about the original text and we don't care for the translator. But see what is happening during the Bhakti movement in India. Saravadas translates or adopts or whatever the main Mahabharati uh, Sanskrit text, Kananita Sanskrit text, the Mahabharata. But then it's known as Sarala Mahabharata. What has he done here? He has rendered Dasa invisible. Balaram Das translates the Ramayana, renders Balmik invisible. This is called Jagamohan Ramayana or Dandi Ramayana. Kambam in Tamil translates the Ramayana or transcreates it or whatever you call it. But it's called Kamba Ramayana. It's not called Balmik Ramayana. So in different cultures, translators assume very different roles. Here, the translator, they don't bother about vanity, they don't worry about translation studies, experts talking about invisibility of translators. Here, translators heroically render the authors of the original invisible. So, see, the translators can be very aggressive, very assertive, and call the translation their own law, and render the, the authors of the original invisible. And then I was talking about during this bhakti movement, the Sanskrit text Bhagavata, scripture, very important. There is a scripture of the Bhagavata into Odia. Jagannath Das translates it into Odia, but he was not a student of linguistics, applied linguistics. He wasn't worried about equivalence, but he produced a brilliant translation of the Bhagavata, which is called uh, Miracle of Translation by Mahadhar Singh, a great scholar. So, how did this Miracle of Translation take place? How could this happen? His mother was an illiterate woman. Like most women in the 16th century, she had not had access to literacy. So Sanskrit Pandit used to charge money for reading out or interpreting and translating the Sanskrit Bhagavata. And this poor woman couldn't uh, understand what he said and he perhaps couldn't pay uh, the fees for listening to uh, the Pandit. Uh, interpreting the Bhagavata. So he requested her son, but Tanta will be in my own mother tongue. So Jagannath Das translates uh, the Bhagavata into extremely accessible area. And now this is Jagannath Das's Bhagavata has become a canonical text in Odisha. Whenever somebody dies, the children read portions of the Bhagavata before he dies. And between Bhagavata Pindu is all over Odisha. Uh, Bhagavata is worshipped, this area text is worshipped and every day read aloud in the evening. So people do, people translate for reasons which cannot be understood, cannot be made sense of in terms of applied linguistics or translation theories. They do it for very human reasons, intensely human reasons. And Edith Grossman, let me take an European example. Edith Grossman, the famous translator of Don Quixote, Don Quixote, and uh, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez has written a uh, lecture, I think, uh, you know, at a Cardinal place has published a uh, 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 work on very short book. Where he says the pleasure of translation 
derives from the opportunity to traverse, to travel in the mental universe of a great writer. That's the reason why it translates uh, Cervantes' Don Quixote, Marquez's novels. So, there are many reasons. For instance, I can give my own example. I can, I have translated my book. First book I translated was Pocket Don Sanapati's uh, autobiography, Pocket Don Cherry, when I was a student at Oxford. I didn't bother about translation theories, I didn't bother about target language, source language, whether I have uh, uh, all, the, all the things that uh, applied linguistics talk about the translation theory talks about. I, I was feeling extremely homesick because I was in a foreign country, far away from home, and I had this autobiography with me, and I read this autobiography. And I thought I should translate it in, in, in English. And every day I would translate a phrase. And this would make it possible for me to overcome feelings of homesickness. Feelings of homesickness and uh, feelings of being away from and they made, made it possible for me to overcome feelings of being away from home, the sadness of being away from home. And there was also another in, for instance, when we are children, we would read a lot of books in translation. For instance, I read uh, this uh, novel that we had, uh, the idea of the mother in India translation. Did I bother whether the translation is faithful, whether it's beautiful, whether it maintains fidelity? Did I worry about the loss that has occurred? No, I didn't bother. I read the novel as if it was written in Odia was moved by the novel and this also led me, this made me a member of what Susan Santa calls the world of the community of literature. That there is, you have communities, you have say uh, British community, the Odia community, the Telugu community, but you also have a community of literature. Recently somebody has written a book, My Country is Literature. You also inhabit a country called literature. And it's inhabited by a community, in the community of literature. So by reading translation, I became a member. I didn't know this Italian novel that he had graduated with, but I didn't know about him as Satan in the suburbs. I didn't know Buddha or what, but I read all these in Odia translation. And without my knowing it, I became a member of the community of literature, of all literature. And then when I learned English, acquired a little English, I also read Mopasa, such stories in English translation, 23 stories, tales by um, Tolstoy, Kafka, all the writers who could read or access to our knowledge of English. So, English for us was not the language of the colonizer or whatever in English, is not something that made, made us appear smarter than others, like some people behave as if the moment they speak English, they, they think that they're smarter. No, for us English was a window to the wider world. Through English, or through the lens of English, we could access, we could view the wider, the large landscape of world literature. I could read Balzac, I could read Turkmen, I could read the great writers of the world, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Chekhov. So, this led me to, but this also generated in us desire the each to translate our literature into English so that it becomes part of world literature. So see the motives of a translator are very different from the translation theories. Why do I translate? Because I I can do many things, overcome homesickness, I can make my literature part of world literature, I can read a great writer and traverse or travel through the rich mental universe of that great writer. I can vicariously experience what Tolstoy thought, what Balzac thought, what Rubai thought, what Camille thought. So there are many reasons. Like uh, I can like Jagannath Das, I can make uh, Sanskrit texts available to illiterate uh, women in villages of Odisha, like Sarah Das, I can bring Mahabharata within the reach of peasants. They don't have to read it, which can be recited. So, translators 
translate because of many reasons. So what we have system systematically done is to neglect the experience of translators. There are great translators in the world, but we haven't bothered about finding out what they felt, what they experienced. For instance, we can imagine Russian literature becoming popular in Britain in the first decade or first two decades of 20th century without a very famous woman called, called um, uh, Dame Constance Garnett. She translated Dostoevsky, uh, Turgenev, uh, and made the British aware of this rich literary tradition that was unfolding in Russia. But has anyone written a biography of Constance Garnett? Her husband was a literary agent, David Garnett, and he was nurturing and mentoring writers like Conrad, Ford Maddox Ford, and all this. He has a biography. People have written his biography. Michael's copy editor, who edited his text, I forget her name, she has written an autobiography called The Step, S-T-E-T. But no translator has received this kind of attention. Nobody has written a biography of a translator. Scott Monty made this famous in the English speaking world. The two wrote his, everybody knows that Scott Monty uh, translated Remembrance of Things Past, this monumental work written in French by Chris. And Scott Monty has not been, uh, no biography of Scott Monty has been written. So there are great translators in the world. But even biographers write their autobiographies. But translators don't write their autobiographies. And nobody writes the biographies of translators. So we don't know how translators feel, what experience they undergo when they translate a text. Because translating a text is an intimate, is an act of intimacy. You can't translate a text without becoming extremely intimate with that text. Nobody translates a text that he hates or she hates. Tiger Hawk, Professor Tiger Hawk is a great translator. Uh, no, I think Ashya Sattar. So that never translated text that you don't love. So intimacy is a very important aspect of the translation process. And intimacy has also a lots of problems. Like in our own lives, if you're intimate with somebody, it's not always a very pleasant experience. So translating a text is an act of intimacy. And it's not always a pleasant experience, but without this sense of intimacy, without this intense engagement with a text, you can't translate it word by word, line by line, sentence by sentence, paragraph by paragraph in a mechanical way. And this is That's why whenever somebody studies translation, they study it within the translation study framework. This is extremely barren sterile and unproductive. So, I was given an opportunity by Professor Mukhishmukhapati when she was head of the department of Italy University, Ravensai University, to get ready a uh, volume of uh, Ravensai Journal of English Studies or something, Ravensai Journal of Literary and Cultural Studies. Uh, it was published in 2017. So, when I was given this opportunity to translate uh, to edit, just edit this journal, I thought I wouldn't waste any time on translation theories, translation studies, comparing one translation with another, loss and gain in translation, equivalent, I thought I had no time for it. They can, all these translation studies experts can do whatever they like. So I focused on some outstanding translators of India and abroad and requested them to reflect upon their experience of translation. And there I was reminded of a very resonant uh, phrase used by Neelak C. Chaudhary in his autobiography. Where he talks about the notion of scholarship. We all think of scholarship as a dry as dust affair. But scholars are dry as dust people. They are very um, uninteresting people. They are hardworking but not interesting. They don't experience emotions when they publish a definitive edition, they write a uh, scholarly article, they are actually not experiencing any emotion. They are totally different. It's what the scholar also experiences the emotion of scholarship. 
without that the kind of books he will produce or write will be extremely uninteresting and inspiring dull oppressively dull and we won't like to read them all great works of scholarship and criticism have also been outcomes of the box of deep love for the subject and have the backing that back by a profound emotional experience the english by a profound emotional so i borrowed this expression the notion of scholarship and i talked to my contributors and asked them to reflect upon elaborate on the notion of translation so i contacted professor vikram das an outstanding translator of parajan many other books which are iconic translations i could contact peter aranujan the result then the iconic translator of sanskara when i contacted professor kaiser hop ashya sattar lorenz remiti and so i contacted all these great translators and some translators from odisha like basu tripathi so we all of them wrote about why they translated what they what kind of emotional experience they uh, on the web when through why they translated why did they choose a particular text did they choose it because somebody prescribed it somebody asked commission them to commission him or her to do it or did they translate it because it spoke to them in very meaningful way that they can uh, help translating it because it meant so much to them it is they they were felt compelled to translate something and all of them said things which are revelatory each one at each article was a revelation and there is an article by lawrence venuti where he talks about how to read a translated text but whenever we read a translated text we simply go to the text we don't bother about the translator so the translator might have contributed a foreword and contributed a preface might have dedicated it to somebody might have talked given a translator's note and all these are extremely important because the translation involves a lot of choices a translator one translator translates a text in a certain way and another translator will translate the same text in a very different way that's why translation is not a mechanical activity there are six translations of omar rubaiyat omar khayyam omar rubaiyat omar khayyam's rubaiyat in odia and each is fundamentally different from the other and uh, one of them is so good that perhaps it's better than the original like uh, Marcus says that the English translation of his 100 years of solitude done by Rabasa is better than the Spanish original. So translators can do strange things. Translation in the world of translation miracles happen. Sometimes the translation, many people think, many scholars think that Jagannath Das's Bhagavata surpasses the Sanskrit original. So this could, so translators reflect on the miracles. that happen in the world of translation this cannot only be understood through rational calculation to reason to uh, theories to concepts to categories they are helpful but they can only go so far and beyond a certain point the subjectivity of the translator is extremely important and all these translators guys are talking about how when he started translating from bangla into english he reconnected with his mother tongue earlier because he studied in the medium of english he had lost touch with his own mother tongue and when he translated he vitally reconnected with his own language mother tongue so this was a profound experience for him and uh, uh, asya sattar said that don't translate something that you don't love it's actually love affair with the text so similarly if you i think um, some of you should uh, try to read this uh, this is this was published in 2017 and here uh, some uh, six or seven translate outstanding translators reflect upon talk about the emotions they experience when they translated a text a literary text into another language they didn't talk about the equivalence about uh, translation ship uh, source language and target language so i think i should stop here i already spoken long enough and i'd like to take a few questions if uh you think that you some question for are in your mind i would love to uh, engage with you but i'm not going to give satisfactory answers okay i hope i have thank you very much sir
and you know we all you know learned a lot actually from you know this one hour lecture we learned a lot of aspects of, on translation and translator thank you for giving a new approach to translator and translation you know and um, though you know in translation studies you know scholars have been writing a lot you know on big aspects but i found you know something you know, the, the, you know some new approaches from your talk sir and i hope you know, this will enlighten all our participants and you know uh, it was so informative so informative that uh, our you know trainees will uh, they uh, you know, get to know about the translators you know and you named a lot you know uh, you named a lot of translators who translated you know the popular texts you talked about history history of translation you know and you know the uh, you know uh, the indic tradition you know the bhakti movement and how you know translation was happening and you know what is translation from in indian perspective and what a translator feels your personal experience and the experience of other translators really sir we you know we, we got to much enlightenment actually and i now the you know it is open for you know uh, discussion i would like to request all our trainees whoever uh, has any question they can ask good morning sir uh, so actually i was having doubt uh, uh, while translating do we need to translate it uh, line by line or we can ignore some lines like uh, now we are doing the project on translation in sixth semester in our final semester so i'm translating okay. some stories in hindi so whether is there is the line by line or uh, what by word or uh, what's your question would you please uh, repeat it you can i ignore some lines which i find can i ignore some lines there which i find is not uh, uh, not required there okay i think when we translate we do not when whenever we translate or whenever a translator translates they don't follow very rigid rules they are taking all sorts of decisions whenever i think if you don't think that certain lines are big the author is alive and copyright is a problem and all that if he insists on every sentence being accounted for that's a different story but translators historically have taken all kinds of liberties with original text because they are they think they have a reader in mind and they they think that these lines may not be uh, useful or they, they, they don't mean anything and they may be a burden on the reader they have done it historically and there are translations which are, for instance paraza by vikram das has actually taken out one third of the text but with the consent of the author but suppose the author is dead for 60 years then people yeah. have adapted their text they have taken out elements so translators have done many things throughout history and you always have that option if you don't think the reader will find it interesting you have that option but the only problem is that the author is alive and if he insists on a literal translation then he might create problems otherwise i think translators are absolutely free to keep the reader in mind and uh, take out portions which they think are unnecessary for a foreign reader or a non native reader yeah sir so i am sampada padgavkar i wish to ask i am sampada padgavkar i wish to ask you uh, how to choose a book for translation how are you going to choose the book i think if you are suppose i am very poor and i am desperate for money and npm gives me some texts and i translate and i get 40000 rupees i must do it but if you want to translate something then it must engage you uh, in a very powerful way if you don't feel uh, a connect with that text if that text doesn't move you if you don't think if you don't love that text and if you don't think that you should share this text with people who don't know that language then don't translate it then no point in translating a text that you don't like only when money is involved only when uh, i need money badly i will try and in case of knowledge text there the whole question is different there if you are a teacher or if you are an academic you are interested in the spread of knowledge or dissemination of knowledge even if you don't like that text you must wrestle with that text and make it accessible to uh, people talking or speaking about the tongue but if you are translating a literary text 
I think if you don't like it, if you don't love it, if it doesn't move you in powerful ways, uh, stay away from it. Don't waste your time. Because I have told you, translation is an intimate, an act of great intimacy. So it's like a friend, if you don't like, how can you uh, spend time with your enemy? Suppose you, uh, somebody asks you to spend a lot of time with someone you hate. Would you like it? Thank you, sir. Thank you नमस्कार सर सर मुझे आपका लेक्चर सुनकर बहुत अच्छा लगा और मैं मानती हूँ कि मेरा सौभाग्य है हम सभी पार्टिसिपेंट्स का कि वक्ता के तौर पर हम आपको सुन पाए और आज के संभाषण में सर आपने ये बताया कि सिद्धांतों से ज़्यादा एहसासों की ज़रूरत होती है अनुवाद के कार्य में और कल्चर के एसेंस को समझना और जो मानवीय जो संबंध हैं उनके भावों को अपने जहन में उतारना ज़्यादा महत्वपूर्ण है बजाय सिद्धांतों को पढ़ने और उसके पठन पाठन के लिए लेकिन सर मैं आपसे एक सवाल ये पूछना चाहती हूँ कि कृपया एक अनुवादक के लिए क्योंकि सिद्धांतिक थियोरीज को या प्रिंसिपल्स को भी जानना बहुत जरूरी है तो कृपया सर उसमें हमें चार या पांच ऐसी बेसिक किताबों के बारे में बताएं जिनको हमें पढ़ना चाहिए ताकि हम अपने जो प्रिंसिपल्स में काम करने का उसको और पुख्ता कर सकें differ from you slightly in the sense that cultures don't have essences. What you derive from your culture or get from your culture may be very different from someone else inhabiting the same culture. That's why a single text can be translated 10 times, 15 times because each translation is an interpretation of that text. Each translation is an interpretation of that culture and your interpretation of your culture will differ from the interpretation of the same culture by someone else. So translation always deals with the possibilities of interpretation. So translation makes us aware of the plurality of interpretations that is possible. That's why no text can be translated once and for all. There is always the possibility of someone translating it again in a different way. So translation teaches tolerance, one thing. The second thing is, of course, you should give for interested in translation where a student of translation there is no harm if you read about the history of translation or translation theories. But I can always talk about Susan Basnet or Lawrence Venuti, translated as invisibility. Or there are many great writers, I think, and Kujo, Cronin. People have written wonderful books about the history of translation or theory of translation or translation studies, like so, Susan Basnet, Magar, or, or many, many, many books you get into it. But I wonder if all these will help you to emerge as a good translator. You translate well if you have this emotion of translation and if you work very hard in order to communicate or convey your interpretation of the text, imagine the reader who is going to read that text and make sure that that reader will like what you, you, you imagine that reader, you are not trying to placate or uh, satisfy some theorist. Other ordinary people will read your translation. If they don't like it, no matter how theoretically informed you are, it doesn't make any... No, all, all these great translators I've talked to never bother about the theory or whatever, they translate. They translate texts which powerfully move them. And they, they have an intense engagement with language. And that's... And translation for them is a creative activity. That's why, as I told you, one person's translation differs radically from another person's translation. Not the same text. Because their individuality has been infused in that text. The way they conceive of a text, the way they interpret the text, the way they hear the music of the text, that it is very different from another person who is translating the same text. So, theory is important, theory, history, all these are important. But when you translate, it's the act of intimacy which is more important. And the music of words, the music of sentences, I think these are more important than and the intense engagement with the text as a friend, text as a person that you are trying to understand. So that I think is more important. So no great translator has really bothered about these things, whether it's equivalent or whether this or the translation six has occurred or, or whether he has colonized or domesticated. That's for students of translation studies. Translators have very little to do with this. I think this is how I live. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, so, my name is Joya, sir. I am from the Ministry of Allahabad. I am a sister professor there. So, first of all, thank you very much for your insightful lecture. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I have two questions, actually. 
uh, first question is so as you mentioned that uh, intimacy and emotions of scholarship these are the very important aspect in the process of translation so do you see that the process of translation also spiritually involves translators is it, is, it, is it like that as you given the uh, illustration of Mohan Senapati's translation of Ramayana that is translated for his wife to solace, give her solace and console her in a way. So does translation, can we see translation as a, can we see translation as a spiritual process? One question. And my second question is sir, so as a translator I have biases. As a translator, I have biases for some cultural practices or some rituals. But in other culture, those practices and rituals are not taboo or not uh, seen in a very derogatory uh, way. We can say. So, while translating, my biases can distort the translation of the text, or my personal biases can give a new meaning to the text. Um, very good question. Um, I think. Uh, the first thing that I mentioned, just mentioned, translators have very different motives. One, why somebody translates something. Uh, the first one, why someone else translates that. So, I give examples of translation can be a source of solace or consolation for someone. Or another, it could be a one way of democratizing knowledge. That knowledge is being, uh, people are being, uh, cut off from sources of knowledge so to in order uh, for his mother to be able to read Bhagavata or understand Bhagavata somebody can translate in my own case I can translate because I want to overcome homesickness through an act of intimacy with a text that is uh, central to my culture so translate so we must look at translators and see what motivates them to translate if we ignore translators we treat them as invisible we uh, if you think that translation is uh, translator is just a mechanic who is transferring meaning from one language to the other, then we will miss this very important aspect of the translation process, therefore not understand the translated text fully. I think translators have various motives for translating. Very few of them translate just because they are asked to translate. That's what we do in exams. So translating is not sitting for an exam. He is doing something as an act of love. He adores a text, he is deeply moved by a text, it means something and there is something this, that, 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 that times a translator is engaged, engaged in, an, in the project of cultural regeneration. For instance in China, they translated Charles Lamb's tales because they wanted to regenerate China, modernize China, they wanted western text to enter China in the 1920s. So translators are all kinds of motives. See, if you don't pay any attention to translators, only read the translated text as if a machine has translated it, then you are missing a very important aspect of translation. That's one. The other thing is that uh, translation is an act of negotiation. We are negotiating with a text. Whenever we negotiate, we do some, we gain some. There are things that we cannot translate fully. There are things that we can translate. There are certain aspects of a foreign culture which can never communicate. For instance, I was, I found that in Hamlet, somebody had translated Hamlet in 1934, and there is this famous example of, I drink to your health. In Oriya, he says that I, uh, uh, there is the, 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 the Oriya translation simply doesn't make sense. He should simply have ignored it, because there is nothing to do, don't drink to someone's health. So, the various cultures are elements which simply don't mean anything in another culture, so we negotiate whether we drop it or find an equivalent in our own culture. So uh, this is a negotiation. Just as we negotiate with a shopkeeper and bargain and uh, negotiate with a, a land owner or whatever. So we negotiate with another culture, another text and there is loss and there is gain. So translation doesn't involve this one-to-one -one correspondence. That there is this text, there is another text, which is its equivalent. There are a lot of negotiations involved and this can be done only when you are extremely sensitive to your own culture and to the culture of another, the otherness of another culture. So, though it's a process of negotiation, and I told you miracles can happen, disasters can also happen. Just as a creative writer can write a very bad poem and a very good poem. Similarly, a translator can produce a very good translation and a very bad translation. So, 
many factors are responsible for. So there is no, it's not a machine which is which is producing something that is perfect. So we have to negotiate with the text and wait for miracles or disasters. I think that's our view. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.